Hello and welcome to the Basic Principles of Electrosurgery presentation. Regardless of whether you're new to the energy portfolio, refreshing your electrosurgery knowledge, or merely have an interest in the area, I hope that this provides you with the information that you're looking for. Internal Olympus staff that are validated by an accredited trainer are able to deliver this presentation to customers in order to assist them in the safe and effective use of their electrosurgical devices. After completion, the aim is for attendees to gain a basic understanding of the principles behind electricity and electrosurgery, to gain some practical knowledge and demonstrate the safe and effective use of electrosurgery, and also to gain a basic understanding of the different delivery methods and the clinical implications associated with these. To give a bit of history about electrosurgery, uh, we need to look at William Bovey, who was an electrophysicist, and Mr. Harvey Cushing, a neurosurgeon. Whilst these gentlemen were not the original inventors of electrosurgery, they were certainly the instigators with their collaboration in order to develop what we now know as modern day electrosurgery. The Aon Journal classify electrosurgery as the most hazardous device used on a daily basis and one that causes more patient injury than any other electromedical device used in the OR. So whilst it's pertinent to be cautious about electrosurgery, certainly not something to be overly alarmed about. Before we can understand anything about electrosurgery, we need to understand a little bit about the properties of electricity. Electricity has three important rules. Firstly, it always seeks ground, just as this lightning strike does in this slide. Electricity will always follow the path of least resistance. And lastly, electricity must complete a circuit or it will not flow. So this slide gives us an example to put that in context where we have the power coming from the power plant into the wall and from the wall outlet into the generator. From the generator, the, the electrical current passes through the patient and then back to the generator in order to complete a circuit. Some terms of electricity that we'll talk about throughout this presentation include frequency, resistance, and obviously this is what opposes the flow of the electrical current, current density, and I'll give an example of how this relates to size and shape of the electrode that's in use. And I suppose some three other important terms um, that relate is power, which is your rate of doing work, and these, this power is measured in watts. The settings that you can see on the generator are measured are the watt wattage settings, uh, voltage measured in volts, and this is the force that's required to push the current. And last but not least, uh, current measured in amps, which is the rate of flow or how fast the current is flowing. And you can see there by this equation that uh, power is a product of both voltage and current. So we need to ask ourselves how many different types of current. Hopefully if you know anything about electricity, there's direct current, and this is where electrons flow in one direction only. An example of this might be your cell phone battery or any uh, cell battery where the, it either, can either uh, discharge or you can put some charge back into it. The other type of current, and one that relates to us in the operating theatre most importantly, is alternating current. And this is where the, there is an equal bidirectional flow of charges and that's flowing all, all the time. And you'll notice down the bottom there of this slide, different frequencies cause different effects and we'll talk about that shortly as we move forward. So here I'm going to give you a demonstration now of a voltage pushing a current through a resistance in order to complete a circuit. So here I've got my generator plugged into the wall outlet which is coming at 50 hertz. As we know the generator is ramping that up to 300,000 hertz. I've got my active electrode imagining I'm the patient. I'm going to, to show you the effect I'm going to try and light up a light globe and returning the current back to the generator is the return electrode plate. So here we go. If I activate, not in the circuit, when I make connection, in the circuit. So we mentioned earlier that resistance is what opposes the flow. And in a practical sense, in the operating theatre, it's important to note that different patient tissue has different levels of resistance. This slide here shows an example of that where uh, you know, blood and fluid is very uh, low in resistance, so it's a good conductor. And moving up the scale, uh, tissue such as lung, scar tissue, any adhesions, that causes more resistance, so it's more of an insulator, and it's going to oppose the flow 
of your current, which may reduce the effect that the operator is trying to achieve. And uh, this comes into play when we're talking about uh, return electrode plaid pads and where we place them a bit later on in this presentation. So based on what we've just covered recently, what do you think are the basic components of a circuit in the operating room of a hospital? We've discussed the generator or your electrosurgical generator, the active electrode getting the current to the patient, obviously your patient or the patient tissue, and also the return electrode. What's the difference between an active and a return electrode? The answer is simply nothing except the size or density of the current. Another question I'll ask is, what's the difference between monopolar and bipolar technology? And the answer is simply, once again, the location of that return electrode and also the size and shape. So to further consolidate that and give you a better understanding of current density, I'll now give you a demonstration of how the size and shape of the electrode can affect the current density. So in order to demonstrate current density to you, I'm going to show you this orange on the return electrode plate. So here we've got good contact, it's got a complete circuit, I'm going to activate, so there you see I get an effect here, but if I take that off there's no, no heat generated there, no untoward side effects. Now if I change the, the contact area or the current density associated with these two, so I'm now going to insert the active electrode, or which was the active electrode, into the orange, but now I'm going to change the current density of my return, or what was my return electrode. Now all of a sudden you will see that I elicit effect through what was the return electrode. So all I've done there is just changed the current density in order to elicit a different effect. So you can imagine if this was on a patient and started peeling off, you would get that sort of effect, which is undesirable. So why don't patients get electrocuted? Well, most people say it's because they're grounded. Well, we're all grounded. It's actually got to do with frequency. If you recall earlier, I mentioned that out of the, out of the wall, we receive current at 50 hertz, and the generator ramps it up to about 300,000 times per second, or 300,000 hertz. Well, if you look on the next slide, muscle and nerve stimulation ceases. So it's actually counterintuitive, but our nerves and muscles are unable to detect this frequency at such a high rate. Electrosurgical generators are often referred to as high frequency or radio frequency generators, and that's simply because they operate in that high frequency range. So some factors that influence thermal spread or in the tissue effects, and by thermal spread I mean the heat that's built up by the resistance within the tissue. So it could be the type and size of the electrode, the different power settings you use, whether you use a cut versus a coag waveform, a desiccate versus fulgurate technique, the length of activation, the type of tissue you're trying to utilise the electrosurgery on, the thickness of the tissue, and also the moisture content. Because you remember, the higher the moisture, the better a conductor of the current it's going to be. So with regards to cut or vaporisation, that gives you little to no coagulation. And within coagulation, there's two different types. You can, be, you can have a fulguration, which has high voltage and low current. The surgeon holds the electrode a short distance from the tissue and an arc jumps from the electrode to the tissue. There's no contact between the active electrode and the tissue. Its main purpose is to provide a broad, superficial and rapid coagulation. In this situation, the tissue is charred. Desiccation is a low-powered coagulation and can be accomplished with monopolar, conventional and advanced bipolar applications. Tissue dehydrates as a result of direct contact with the electrode. In doing so, touching the tissue reduces the current concentration, resulting in less heat being generated. This form of energy works well to stop bleeding. You'll see a few important factors here that influence the cutting performance of electrosurgical instruments. The type, as well as the size of the electrode tip, influences the ability to cut. A smaller electrode means higher current density. In other words, a fine edge or point on the electrode will require less power to yield a clean cut. Tissue traction will provide a smaller contact point for the electrode. The length of time the surgeon maintains contact with the targeted tissue will influence the cutting action. The longer the contact, the greater the thermal spread. Embedding the electrode too far into tissue will result in less cutting and more coagulation. Different types of tissue can respond differently to the current. 
Remember, fat has more resistance than muscle due to the high water content. Muscle is well perfused and has much less resistance. Power settings and selected waveforms will also influence cutting performance. Here on the next slide, you'll see some adverse outcomes that could occur. Remember, electrosurgery, it's not something any of us should take for granted. This is because when electrosurgery is used, three things can happen and two of them can result in serious injury. As intended, electrosurgery can accomplish cutting, coagulation, or a blend of both effects, and is seen as a benefit to the patient. However, when electrosurgery doesn't go exactly as planned, adverse outcomes are the result, as seen on this slide. In order to overcome some of these adverse outcomes, some technological advancements have been developed. As is so often the case, each new generation of technology was developed to improve the previous one. Each has advantages when considering performance and or safety characteristics. A grounded system is happy for current to go to ground. Any ground, that could be even through the metal pole, which may or may not be in contact with the patient. There is no mechanism to measure leaking. This is not Australian standard. This slide depicts a grounded generator. This type of generator significantly increases the patient's risk of burn injury at the return electrode site or alternate pathway sites. With this type of generator, the current is referenced to ground, which leads to the possibility of burns at the return electrode site, as well as alternate pathway sites because of current diversion. In such cases, if return electrode contact or conductivity is compromised, or if resistance at the active electrode site increases significantly, such as during Eschgar buildup, the current has a difficult time returning to the return electrode and may thus seek the path of least resistance and exit the patient at an alternate site. The current may exit the body at a site that has a small surface area, such as the tip of a finger touching a metal surface or an ECG lead, and the patient is burned. Consequently, always use grounded generators with extreme caution. Grounded generators use return electrodes that may consist of one of the following. A metal plate that is coated with conductive gel, a return electrode with a dry conductive adhesive surface, a return electrode coated with a water-based gel, or a return electrode coated with the preferred hydrogel adhesive that is high in moisture content. All of these return electrodes have a single plate configuration. This next slide depicts an isolated generator. Note how the current from the wall outlet enters the generator and then returns to the ground. As it passes through the generator, an isolated current is generated. This type of generator significantly reduces the patient's risk of an alternate site burn, secondary to current diversion, because the current is referenced back to the generator. If such generators are not equipped with a contact quality monitoring system, a burn at the return electrode site may occur because of insufficient return electrode contact or conductivity. Like a grounded generator, an isolated generator without a contact quality monitoring system uses return electrodes that may consist of a metal plate that is coated with a conductive gel, a return electrode with a dry conductive adhesive surface, or a return electrode coated with the preferred hydrogel adhesive that is high in moisture content. All of these return electrodes have a single plate configuration. The generator won't function if the patient return electrode is not placed on the patient because the current is unable to complete the circuit back to the generator. The only way to complete the isolated circuit is through the patient return electrode. This safety feature has virtually eliminated the concerns regarding alternate site burns. However, it doesn't prevent a burn under the patient return electrode. And now I'll give you a demonstration of what I mean by that. So here I'm using an isolated generator in order to complete the circuit. Okay, so it's the patient return plate is returning the circuit back to the generator. However, if I remove the return electrode plate, there's no return, not in the circuit, there's no effect. So this has virtually eliminated all alternate site burns for patients, but you can imagine as you saw with the current density demonstration, if the plate started peeling off where I had an area of high current concentration, then there's potential still for a patient return electrode site burn. This next slide shows the generator equipped with a contact quality monitoring system. Note how the return electrode and the patient interface has become compromised, thus creating the potential for a burn, as you just saw with the last demonstration. Before the burn occurs, however, a visual and an audible alarm is activated and the generator is immediately deactivated. Once again, I'll give you another demonstration of that now. So in order to overcome those patient return electrode site burns, I'm going to demonstrate to you a generator that's equipped with contact quality monitoring. So as the contact of the 
the quality of the contact of the plate to the patient interface is compromised, the generator will deactivate. So you can see there, only a small component of the plate has come off me as the patient. Earlier we discussed different energy delivery methods. Monopolar energy is probably the most common type of electrosurgery that we see in the OR. With monopolar energy, we see the tissue effect where the active electrode touches the tissue to either cut, coagulate, ablate or desiccate. We can also see fulguration of the tissue. There's a relatively low cost associated with this energy. Its disadvantages are obvious. Since current passes through the patient's entire body, there's a huge potential for injury, especially if all safety parameters are not met. Collateral tissue damage can also happen through the spread of heat with this technology. And we also see a lot of surgical plume created. Bipolar energy is different than monopolar energy. With bipolar, the tissue effect takes place between two electrodes of the device. Electric current passes directly from one electrode through the tissue to the opposing electrode and then back to the generator. Current doesn't pass through the patient's body, only through the tissue between the electrodes. If both electrodes are not in contact with the tissue, the device will not function properly. Conventional bipolar devices are good coagulators. However, they can be very slow or possibly not cut the tissue effectively. Once again, surgical plume is created here. The advantage of advanced bipolar energy is that it's measuring impedance. In doing so, you're able to get a reliable, consistent vessel seal, you reduce your thermal spread, and you also reduce your tissue sticking because you're not overcoagulating. However, it's also a bipolar device, so both the electrodes must be in contact with the tissue, which can be challenging. And once again, surgical plume is also created. Ultrasonic energy, although not electrosurgery, because electrical current doesn't pass through the patient's body, is also mentioned here because we now have some devices or a device which incorporates both ultrasonic and bipolar technology in the one device. The advantages of this is it cuts and coagulates tissue simultaneously. And as mentioned, no current passes through the body. However, this can also be a disadvantage because especially in the larger vessels that you want to seal, if you're cutting and coagulating at the same time, you're potentially not achieving a reliable and consistent seal. And whilst we're talking about sealing vessels, there are three requirements of all energy sources that are needed in order to provide a reliable seal of a vessel. Namely, pressure, which includes the lumen of the vessel, an elevated or increased temperature, which stimulates collagen from vessel walls to intermingle and infuse. And then the seal is created after this intermingling of the collagen and a reliable cooling time. Remembering most efficient sealing occurs at low levels of heat. A good example of this would be when you're cooking a steak on a barbecue. If you wanted a well done bit of steak, you would turn the burners down low and cook one side evenly and then turn it over on the other side. There are three areas of concern for safety when using electrosurgical devices. They're the generator, including power settings and cords, electrodes and the environment. Let's look at each of these now. The generator should be checked for any signs of damage. If there's any question about the integrity of the generator, it should be checked by a biomedical engineer. Generators should be plugged directly into a wall outlet and not into a power strip or extension cord. The power cord should be checked to make sure it's not frayed or damaged. Any other accessories that are attached to the generator should also be checked. Instructions for use that accompany the device will provide more specific information. Never put heavy objects or containers or fluid on top of a generator. Fluid and electricity are a dangerous combination. Most generators today have electronic components that might be damaged if something heavy is put on top of the generator also. Safety measures regarding monopolar and bipolar active electrodes involve inspecting the active electrode for damage before use, including the insulation cord and handpiece. Never let anyone force a connector into the generator. This is a clue that the instrument is not meant to be used with that generator. Activate the electrode only when ready to use. Always place the active electrode into an insulated holster when not in use. If the active electrode should fall off the sterile field and down the side of the OR table, ask to disconnect it immediately to prevent accidental activation or related risks. Always clean the active electrode to prevent char buildup on the active electrode tip and accessories. Don't activate it if flammable vapours such as those from alcohol prep solution are present. In bipolar electrosurgery, one side of the instrument tip is the active electrode and the opposing tip is the return electrode. Care should be taken not to contact the two electrodes together and activate the instrument 
when not grasping. This could result in aberrant current conduction and a potential burn. In monopolar energy, the breakdown of insulation can occur along the shaft of an active electrode. This can allow the energy an opportunity to seek another path of lesser resistance. Monopolar return electrodes have many safety considerations. Thoroughly assess and document skin integrity before and after the procedure. Always select a new and unopened disposable adhesive dispersive pad appropriate for the patient's size and weight. Never use a pad that has been left open and never cut a pad to custom fit a patient. Pad placement is key to avoiding burns. There must be adequate tissue perfusion to promote electrical conductivity and to dissipate heat. Ideal placement for return electrode plates is over a clean, dry, large muscle mass. Other sites may increase resistance to current flow, thereby increasing the risk of burns. Avoid, avoid excess fatty tissue, bony prominences, scar tissue, and any known metal prostheses. Place the dispersive electrode as close to the surgical site as possible in order to allow the current to exit the body as quickly as possible. Radio frequency current, unlike the 50 cycle current from the wall outlet, can and does leak through the insulation on the cord or the electrode. No matter how thick the layer of insulation is, there will be some current leakage with the use of this high frequency current. The higher the voltage, the more insulation it can overcome, resulting in a higher amount of leakage current. Consequently, avoid wrapping active electrode cords around metal instruments and bundling cords together. I will now give you a demonstration regarding high frequency current leakage. So now I'm going to give you a demonstration to show why we shouldn't wrap and bundle cords together or wrap them around metal instruments. Because what's going to happen here is that the current that's leaking out of the insulation through the active electrode is going to excite the neon within this fluorescent globe to light it up. Here we go. This now concludes the basic principles of electrosurgery presentation. In summary, we've covered the principles of electricity and electrosurgery, some electrosurgical safety innovations, and also discussed best practices to ensure both patient and staff safety.